This is a video series on the misunderstood dangers of too much iron in the body and for older people the risk of diseases and early death as a result. Today we're on holiday in Vietnam at Nim Binh in a bamboo hut by a small lake, basically in the middle of nowhere. In this particular video I'll explain the processes in the body involved in iron intake and storage overload and then finally the oxidation which causes all the damage. I'll, do, I'll then go on to show the evidence of high ferritin levels causing early death. First of all let us understand how iron gets in the body. Think of iron intake process as being a river feeding into a lake like the Dead Sea where the lake has no exit points. Just like in the Dead Sea, a small amount of salt in the water builds up as the water evaporates. Imagine there is control for water intake. It's a sluice gate which can reduce the amount of water entering and divert the water somewhere else. Of course, the salt can collect on the water's edge and blow away. Now think the salt is the iron and the lake is the body. The sluice is a protein called hepcidin which can reduce the iron flow and allow the iron to exit through the stomach and leave the excrement. Hemochromatosis sufferers have a faulty sluice gate which allows all the water to come, to come through and it's thought that people with a leaky gut syndrome may have a similar problem even if they can produce hepcidin. The only way the body can normally lose iron is through sweat, similar to the water evaporating from the lake, left on the water's edge and the salt blowing away. In the body there is a separate mechanism for removing iron called chelation, which involves taking a substance called a chelator. This is similar to using a sponge to take out the water and with it some of the dissolved salt, but just as you need lots of sponges to make a difference, you'd need lots of chelation material to affect the iron levels. Iron is not normally excreted in urine, although if you have such a large amount that you're being poisoned by the iron, some of it will. Another much easier way to lose, lose iron is to lose blood, where every pint of blood will remove 250 milligrams of iron because the red blood cells contain hemoglobin, where each hemoglobin molecule contains the iron. This is why menstruating women or blood donors are not affected in early life if they suffer from hemochromatosis. This is equivalent to using a scoop to scoop out the water of the lake like a bucket being used by a helicopter to get the water out of the lake. Let's do an aside on the difference between iron poisoning and iron overload. Iron poisoning is immediate. If you overdose on iron, supplement tablets, which have been known to happen with children thinking they are sweets, then you are poisoned by the iron and it could kill you immediately or within a few days. Iron overload is taking amounts of iron which do not amount to an overdose on any one day, but over the year the body builds up iron levels which, which then become dangerous. This is similar to the lake, the, the Dead Sea, with no exit, getting saltier water with time. Eventually the salt in the lake gets so strong it kills all life, like the Dead Sea. Now this is clearly affects hemochromatosis sufferers because their sluice gates are broken, but it is my belief it affects far more people, but to a less extreme state, because the levels of iron take much longer to get excessive, but it still happens. It is my conclusion that the number of people affected is similar to the number of young people affected by anemia, and yet it is the young anemia sufferers which are the focus of everyone's attention. Okay, now let's look at the evidence for the link between the death rate and the iron overload. Not much has been done on this, but the Danish have done the most studies. This, is, this be, 
diagram is the first study I'll show you is not related to hemochromatosis but purely related to the amount of iron in the body so it would include hemochromatosis and non-hemochromatosis patients remember that anyone can suffer from iron overload it's not just hemochromatosis patients who are more likely to suffer from it though so what this study did was divide a population of nearly 9,000 people into bands split by a grouping of levels of ferritin in the blood. What it shows is that people with high ferritin levels die earlier than people with low levels. The effect is quite mar marked for ferritin levels over 600 milligrams per litre, as the median age of death for this is 55. Note that quite a few died at 38, which is quite shocking. So why did I not die at 55? I'm now 62. The reason is I have a separate issue in, in, in my transferrin level, which is another protein, um, is low due to another and separate genetic defect. So it takes longer for my iron level to build up to the level at which it causes damage. There is clearly a spread in the death age for any one ferritin level and this would be expected because there are ranges of iron and processes involved are far from simple. We'll discuss this in a minute. When I showed this to my doctor he said people die from all sorts of diseases. Yes and indeed they do but because we have solved many of the infectious diseases we are left with the non-communicable diseases i.e. those associated with old age. And the point we are trying to make here is that iron contributes to all the diseases of old age and therefore plays a part in lowering the age of death on average. And that's why you see the effect in the nine people study of 9,000 people. Let's explain how iron contributes to increased inflammation and therefore decreases the age of death. When you eat food containing iron, it's absorbed by the stomach wall called the enterocytes and these get through to the blood in the form of Fe2 plus iron. It, it may be converted from Fe3 plus by something called a duodenal cy cytochrome. Once in the enterocyte it can be converted to ferritin. Then something called ferroportin, another protein, allows Fe2 plus to enter the blood, but it can be controlled by the hepcidin at this point, which controls the rate at which the iron enters the blood. Hemochromatosis sufferers have hepcidin deficiency and cannot reduce the amount of iron moving it into the blood. Most of it enters, and this is the root cause of the iron overload in those people. Once the Fe2 plus is in the, iron, in the blood, it can be moved around by transferring each transferrin molecule can carry two Fe2 plus ions. If the transferrin becomes saturated with iron, i.e. it holds two ions, um, this instructs the liver to produce hepcidin. In this way, you can see the only control of iron is via hepcidin, and it's a control of input, not once it's in the body, there is actually no way to get rid of it. After this point, any iron coming into the body accumulates until there is blood loss. Approximately one milligram can be lost in sweat and skin loss per day. Hepcidin is also produced if the person has inflammation. And in this case, the hepcidin is instructing the conversion of Fe2 plus to ferritin, where it becomes Fe3 plus. In the bone marrow, Iron is used to produce the red blood cells in the construction of haemoglobin. If the level of iron in the blood gets too high, then it is stored for future loose use in the protein called ferritin. If ferritin level gets too high, then iron starts to get deposited in the organs. In particular, the liver gets the most, but if the amounts get too high, it gets deposited everywhere in the joints, the heart, the pancreas and the skin itself and the brain. Some hemochromatosis sufferers have darkest coloured skin because of the iron. The problems start to occur 
As the levels get high in the organs, the iron can react with naturally produced hydrogen peroxide and produce free radical hydroxyl ions. This process is called oxidation and will cause inflammation in the areas where the iron is present at high levels. Of course, inflammation can occur for many other reasons other than iron, but all we are saying is that iron is one of the causes of inflammation. The fact that there are other causes of inflammation is part of the reason why we can get a spread in the age of death for the same level of iron. So, how can non-hemochromatosis people still suffer from iron overload? Well, another Danish study found, um, of Danish people found the following. They looked at 6,000 people and did DNA analysis of them. The three mutations which associated with, with hemochromatosis are called C282Y, H63D and S65C. It's the C282Y which is the strongest effect and having two of them, one from each parent, is the, the real problem and that's what I have. This is what um, also one in 200 Northern European descent people have. So people in Denmark, the UK, Ireland, Northern France and all descendants of those people. If we look at the eye column, you'll see the normal range is 100 to 250 to 250 for people with no hemochromis, hemochromatosis mutations. However, the circles and stars show that there's always individuals outside this range with iron overload, which is anything more than 300. Unfortunately, in an effect, to simplify things, this graph does, don't, doesn't show the effect of age because iron overload is cumulative with age, averaging over all ages, and that it prevents us seeing the effects in the old, except for hemochromatosis sufferers, where the effect is so strong it can be seen in people in their 30s. Anyway, this graph, although misleading for the old, is useful in that it shows that everyone can suffer iron overload, although it's the hemochromatosis sufferers where the effect is most clear because it affects people faster and at an earlier age. To me, this is, in, this is an interesting diagram because it shows the iron overload picture for non-hemochromatosis people. Note, again, it would be better to show such a graph for only for old people because the young dilute the real picture. But this still shows quite a few interesting things. Firstly, there is only 0.9% of people in the top right hand quadrant and they are only and the ones in there are only bordering it this is basically saying people without hemochromatosis mutations don't get hemochromatosis however 12.4% have iron overload and this is the definition of iron overload as being over 300 the number 300 is arbitrary chosen by some doctors some 40 years ago and in my opinion is actually still too high. Anyway, the point is 12.4% of this population of all ages have iron overload and in this case the iron might be doing some damage to the organs. In this case there is a high ferritin but with lower transferrin saturation. This basically indicates the source of the iron overload is inflammation rather than hemochromatosis. Basically, the body is experiencing inflammation and as a result will be trying to reduce the iron in the inflamed area by converting it to ferritin. This is an attempt to reduce the chance of cell damage around the sore area by removing the highly oxidative powers of the iron. However, just as with hemochromatosis, at a certain point the ferritin level will get so high that it then needs to be reduced and will be deposited in the organs. Once the ferritin in the organs reaches a high level, it will cause cell damage again, but this time to the organs. So, 
non-hemochromatosis people still suffer the same effects as hemochromatosis people. And note, this time the numbers are not 1 in 200 as for hemochromatosis, but 12.4% of the population and actually very much higher percentage of older people. This is more than the number experiencing anemia. So the argument about adding iron to food becomes very poor indeed. My view is that people who suffer from anemia should be given iron pills and not be fed iron, which is a poison, in an uncontrolled way when it is added to flour, peat bread, peanuts, breakfast cereal, etc. Remember, anemia does not kill, usually kill people, but iron overload actually does cause people to die earlier. Now, let's have a quick look at the diagram again and look at what happens if the arbitrary level of 300 for the point at which iron overload would reduce to, say, 150. You'll notice it would now encompass very many more people. Now, why would I say 150? Well, let's look at this diagram, which was done in studies into the effects of ferritin on diabetes. As already explained, diabetes is one of the main, re main age-related diseases caused by iron overload. And please note, diabetes can be caused by more than just iron overload, e.g. too much sugar causing insulin resistance is the common cause. But iron too damages the pancreas and causes insulin resistance as well. So these things are very similar and connected. Anyway, the interesting thing about this graph is that diabetes reduces the production of haemoglobin and as a result causes tiredness and being easily out of breath when exercising. Now also note peak haemoglobin is between 80 and 100. So my point about 300 being the arbitrary healthy limit is explained because at 300 haemoglobin is reduced by about 1% in non-diabetes people and overall diabetes reduces, um, if you have diabetes, it reduces haemoglobin by 5-6%. to 6%. The point to make is that for everyone, the optimum ferritin level is around 80 to 100, and this is what people should aim for. But going back to the, this graph, you'll see a majority of non-haemochromatosis and healthy people in the study had ferritin levels well over 100. And the reality is, because this is all ages, the severity of the effect in the older people is less obvious. So as an older person, most people should optimise for lower ferritin, i.e. don't eat fortified foods, eat less red meat, and don't have orange juice with meals. The vitamin C causes iron to be absorbed, so drink orange juice um, when you're not eating other types of food. It is possible for the old to have anemia, but this may be due to cancer or other form of inflammation and should not be treated with iron anyway as the deficiency is in red blood cells. This graph is quite interesting because it shows the effect of haemoglobin being lowered as the venesection is performed. I have experienced this because the day after each venesection I feel weaker and, and get easily out of breath when going upstairs. You can see the lines cross over at the point of 150 for non-diabetes people. So this is further evidence that the iron overload limit should be closer to 150, not 300. Well, that, um, that concludes this video.